Welcome to Nature Revisited, a podcast that explores our relationship with the natural world. It consists of interviews, stories, and discussions that highlight the notion that nature is not a place one goes to, but rather a place one is already a part of, that we are nature. On this edition of Nature Revisited, I would like to welcome Matt Lutz to the podcast. Matt is an associate professor of architecture at the School of Architecture and Arts at Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont. Matt is also a member of the Vermont Board of Architects, which works to promote further high-performance, sustainable building practices. I first met Matt while he was on his way to Africa to visit a project that he was involved with. Though our conversation was somewhat brief, I invited him to join me on the podcast upon his return to talk about our relationship between housing and nature and what the role of the architect might play. I have often wondered, what is the relationship between our houses, the places where we live, and nature, the world that surrounds them? While we focus on energy efficiency and shrinking our footprint during this climate crisis, doesn't it need to go a bit deeper? Or do our houses simply provide refuge from nature and are not really connected to it? And how, if the role of the architect changing, is our relationship with nature and the planet changes? This spring, I joined Matt at the beautiful campus of Norwich University in the Green Mountains to talk about nature and the architect. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and this is Nature Revisited. So as you know, Nature Revisited is about looking at the different ways that people relate to nature and how these relationships are changing as we all move forward in an ever-changing environment. One of these relationships I have been wanting to feature is the relationship we have to where we live, our houses and our planet, and the role that the architect plays in that relationship. I think we all agree that the population on the planet is increasing. How fast and by how much is another issue. But everyone has to live somewhere, and most live in houses, houses designed by architects. How much did nature and the environment affect your pursuits as an architect? Well, you know, growing up, I had the fortunate circumstance of moving around a lot. So I was born in Rouse's Point, New York, about 90 miles north of here. Romped around in the Adirondack foothlands and spent a lot of time on Lake Champlain. And then at nine years old, my family moved to southern Georgia to a barrier island. So from the northern border to the southeast Georgia coast. And there, I got to explore the marshlands, pull a seine net on the barrier islands, and cook seafood on the beach. And then uh, when I was an early teenager, I moved to the southwest Texas desert, El Paso. You know, there I romped around out in, the, out in the desert and explored that landscape. And I think moving around from landscape to landscape and culture to culture really influenced how I, how I think about architecture today because it allowed me to, I guess, embrace and really appreciate differences. You know, coming from the Northeast, 
from Rouse's point, that that was the first landscape or the first environment that I knew. And so moving to southern Georgia, experiencing winter without snow was, it was a, a, just a shock. But it was also really thrilling. And that, at a pretty early age, turned me on to watching the landscape. Uh, you know, from building forts with friends to fishing and hiking, those things were really important. I think that's the earliest path that I got onto in looking at buildings. So what was that relationship? How did that start between the nature that you were experiencing and then realizing that within this nature, there are pe people have to live and have houses? No, I looked at architecture through um, skateboarding. I was not a great student, and I heard about this class that was, the teacher was sort of renowned for giving everyone A's, and it was an easy class. And so I thought, that's for me. And I went into that class, and his name was David Sharp, one of the most influential teachers I had. He said, well, what, what do you want to draw? You have to draw something. And I said, well, you know, being clever, I said, well, I'm going to draw a skateboard ramp. He said, okay, I'll, I'll show you how to, how to do that and how to make a set of drawings so you could then build it. And I worked on that every day, and I found out that all the students were getting there a little early. They were showing up during lunch. They were staying late. And the reason people were getting A's was not because he wasn't paying attention. It's because he found a way to really inspire and sort of share his enthusiasm for it. That was really my first introduction to making. I was able to build something. I think I then just naturally connected that with my love of the outdoors. So why did you choose to become a architect, and why do you teach it? Let me address the, the second part first. Thing, if you really want to learn something, teach it. I think it was Monteverdi Verity that said, I must be allowed to speak long enough so that I can know my own thoughts. And dialoguing with people about a subject, like we're doing here, is a good way to reveal or develop new ideas. When you're teaching, you're just dwelling in the world of ideas. And that's important for architecture. Uh, architecture moves pretty slow relative to other things that we make. If we think about the automotive industry, for example, it moves relatively fast compared to the uh, technology of architecture. So working, working in an environment where it's a constant stream of new ideas is really, really gratifying. Yeah. I guess I chose to follow architecture because I really appreciated making things from, you know, building forts in the salt marshes of southern Georgia with, with a good friend. I came to architecture directly from there and directly from making that first, building that first skateboard ramp with plywood and two by fours to build something, to bring something into the world that wasn't there before and to have that thing be useful that skateboard ramp that was two sheets of plywood and four two by fours, it wasn't about the object of the ramp. It was about all the experiences that my friends and I at the time got from that object. So we weren't really building the object, we were building the experiences that the object gave us. And I thought, well, that's the same, that's the same with buildings. That's when I decided, I think, that architecture would be important. So do you think that most people, particularly in this culture that we live in, when they either buy a house or have someone design a house, mm -hmm. do you think that there is a real connection for them when it comes to nature? And where does nature and architecture meet? Yeah, I think in some cases, someone isn't getting architecture they're looking for shelter because that's the position that they're they're in architecture isn't part of it 
isn't part of the equation. They're looking for an envelope to keep the rain off, to stay warm in, to cook in, to provide basic needs. You know, in terms of a connection to nature, there are uh, situations here in Vermont where people want protection from nature because nature, nature doesn't forgive, uh, and it can be pretty harsh. So, uh, you know, I think there's that end of the spectrum. Then there's the other end of the spectrum where folks can, you know, build a house out of all glass. The notion is, well, I want to dwell in nature. So I'm going to build a house entirely of glass, which is going to consume exponentially more energy than the person that's just just has a simple envelope to keep rain and snow and wind out. On one end of the spectrum, we've got the person who, in air quotes, wants to embrace nature and is burning through, you know, millions of tons of fossil fuel to keep exaggeration, but to keep to keep the house warm and experiencing architecture like that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's someone who can't really afford more than simple shelter and is not consuming much energy at all. So how has the current environmental crisis kind of inf influenced the way you design and what you teach? One of the things that I've started here at Norwich was introducing digital energy modeling. So there's software available that's free to students that allows students to build a digital model of a building and then analyze it in terms of its environmental impact. And to analyze what daylighting conditions are like, how much solar gain it will receive, uh, what its thermal envelope is like, or what its heat loss profile would be like. Introducing to students that this is what you want, but what do we need? And trying to reconcile those two things. And then also the energy modeling shows, here are the consequences of those design moves. If you do this, you get that. If you do this, you get that. And historically, that was something that happened sort of much later in the design process. It was almost an afterthought. You know, we would design the thing that we wanted and then determine whether that was what we needed in terms of its energy consumption. And so now that process through the digital energy modeling, we get sort of an instant feedback loop. So we can look at a hundred designs and look at the consequences of, the, of each design move. What happens when we add another 10 square feet of glass? Do we overheat the building? Do we, you know, do, do we get more heat loss at night because of that window? What does it cost to, keep, to put that window there annually? That's probably one of the biggest changes that you know, climate change has brought to, to education. So how much does the land or the surroundings of a building play into their design? In other words, where we put that building, does that play a part in the building itself? You get people who build these huge houses in the middle of places where they really should not be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, I'm curious, is, does the architect who designed that building, does he get involved in where that building is placed? Um, I want to say yes, but what I should be saying is ideally, yes, that, that should happen every, every time. And the architect should know how to read the land, whether that's an, in, an urban environment or whether that's a rural environment. A project that I'm working on, on now, you know, I've been visiting that site for well over a year, just walking over it in different seasons, looking at the ground. Is that ledge? Is it clay? How does the water move on it? What species are living on the land? You know, the Vermont BioFinder map can show us where the wildlife corridors are, where the forest blocks are, are there endangered species in the area? There's no rocket science here. All the data, all the materials are right in front of us. 
almost clubbing us all over the head. It's so, so omnipresent. So I think these are things, at least working in a, in a rural environment, those are resources that are right there. So there's no excuse not, not to use them. All of those things make the project sustainable. And, I, and when I mean sustainable, I don't mean sustainable sort of just immediately on the, you know, looking at the, uh, the electrical meter, but long-term sustainability. You know, we won't be revisiting a building in 20 years if we do it right the first time. Uh, the statistics that are coming out now about the cost of rework in construction, and a rework is when we, you know, we design something, it doesn't work, we have to go back and rework it. Or we build something and the construction somehow failed and we have to rework it. The environmental cost of rework is staggering. So if we get the design right the first time, we can eliminate so much waste. So when we look at the, the site or the, the land that the building goes on, our vision for that land is much greater than just the outline or the boundary. Uh, we're looking at all the resources that are available that contribute to it and how that land contributes back, back out. From my perspective, it seems like ideas are recycling every 10 years. Now there's this renewal in, of interest, looking at land as a generative system. So when we make a building, how do we make it in such a way that it's a, it's, it's a net positive introduction somehow? That's a tough thing. That's a really tough thing to do because you know, the first law of thermodynamics gets in the way of, of that. In that same vein, do, do you teach land ethics? Is that part of architecture to kind of look at that, that relationship of a land ethic? Yes, every accredited architecture program will have as part of its curriculum a site design project. And then every architecture curriculum has a series of design studios that begin with the first year and go through the four or five year program. Throughout that, those studios, there's an intense sort of holistic approach to the building design. Someone wrote that the study of architecture done completely as an undergraduate degree would be about 19 years. So if we studied everything that you really needed to know to be an architect, it's about 19 years. But it gives you the sense of all the different hats that we have to wear. You should be something of a farmer to be an architect. You should be something of a teacher. You should be something of an engineer and an artist. You should know construction and business because these things all come at a cost, uh, long-term and short-term. The land ethic is something that architecture is always going to be in, in, in some degree in conflict with that. Architecture is violent. What we do to the land, we dig holes. Sometimes we have to blast. Um, sometimes we clear really big areas. I think something that, that I struggle to, or yeah, struggle to understand about uh, technology and energy consumption is how affluence affects our, our energy consumption. It's a really complex thing. You know, the United Nations uses this formula and sort of an infinite number of derivatives of the formula um, IPAT. And it's uh, I for environmental impact uh, equals PAT or P for population, A for affluence, which is the gross domestic product of, the, of a country, and then T for technology. Technology is a modifier that we can, if we take the population and their gross domestic product, then we take uh, technology and either modify it up or down. So technology is how efficient that population produces their gross domestic product. And so what it's looking at is how affluent the society is directly affects environmental impact. And when I, when I started looking at that 
it made me see that um, the community that we work with in Palmer in Tanzania, their environmental impact is, I would think it was about a t one twentieth of mine here in the States. They don't drive cars. The electricity that they use, they purchase before they use it, which is very different from us because here we use it as much as we want. We have no limit on the amount we can use. And then we look at the bill afterward and figure out how we're going to pay it. And there, you have to buy it before you use it. And so the, the environmental impact of that community is so small compared to, to I think, to, to ours. And it brings up the question of prosperity. How do we regulate prosperity? And prosperity probably shouldn't be regulated. That maybe we shouldn't even be looking at putting a, a limit on. When you ask about sort of the, the mega mansion and the, the, con the energy consumption that a mega mansion uses, well, you know, if we build that to passive house standards, uh, we could, whatever the size of it is, we can reduce the energy consumption of that, of that space by half. Now, if we build it to passive house standards and build half the house, now we've <laughs> cut it by half again. So does the size of the house matter? Well, yeah, it certainly does. I don't know how to address the prosperity issue because if, you know, someone has a certain amount of resources available to them. I don't, I don't know how to. How do we convey to our population that we have an obligation to nature yeah. and that what they are doing is detrimental to the planet? It seems to me that we do have an obligation to nature. Yeah. In a lot of ways, our, our culture doesn't think that way. When is that going to catch up to the notion that we're at 420 something parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere? And it's climbing, you know, two, two and a half points every year. When are, um, when, when are we going to acknowledge that and make the changes necessary? If we could ask the planet, what do you, what do you think we should do? Frankly, I think the planet would say, that's up to you because I'm going to win one way or the you know right. I'm, I'm going to continue right. to right. do my thing um, so do you think that when you go to places like tanzania that 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 population the reason they do the things they do has a direct connection to, with nature or is it because of their situation forces them to in other words when you say that they pay for their electricity first mm -hmm. is that a conscious effort on their culture to say you know this is the way we want to do things yeah um, and we think it, it's beneficial to us and to our environment. I think that is, that is part of it. You know, in Tanzania, the, you know the plastic shopping bags that we outlawed, what is it, last year? Or? So they outlawed those years ago. Maybe to some degree resources are, are limited in places. I got to say, there's, there is a cultural difference between... You know, at least the community that I was working with, there's a cultural difference between their connection with things and what I see here. The, the person that I worked with the most there in the sunflower seed processing facility, you know, had three, three changes of clothes, three shirts, three sets of pants, two, two pairs of shoes, uh, one to wash, one to wear, one just in case. That was it. I think his uh, notion of prosperity is not acquiring a bigger house. It's maybe spending more time out in the field on walks and runs. And is that part of what you're teaching to, is to, to have your students aware of the different cultures and that relationship with architecture? Yeah, the architecture program, study abroad is mandatory. So we spend a semester abroad. And there are so many resources through the Center for Civic Engagement to, tra to travel ab abroad. Um, it's a mission of the university to get students 
um, to experience different cultures. And it's an international campus, so in the design studio that we're in, you know, we might have you know, someone from Europe, we might have someone, also someone from Asia, someone from Africa, and of course North, North America, all sort of practicing together in the studio. And so when everyone's presenting their projects, those uh, cultural differences sort of get into the experience of the building or the experience of the project. The more important side of it is we're not making an object, we're making experiences for humans. That's, that's, what it, that's what it is. And those experiences are influenced by the cultures that we come from. Over the past 15 years, I've seen the university become more internationalized. That has been great for the School of Architecture. So let's talk a little bit about in, in the culture here, uh, we talk about the mega house. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be kind of an, another, the, the, kind of the opposite of that is the tiny house. Mm -hmm. From an architectural point of view, how do you view that kind of enthusiasm from people? For me, it's a, you know, the tiny house is definitely a love, love, hate thing because I've, I've designed them, I've helped build them, I would love to have one myself. They're really great for, for a number of reasons. And I think they're important right now. I think the trajectory of their importance is going to climb. I think they're just going to become more and more important. At the same time, it, I don't want to sound too critical about the, the tiny house because I think it's a really good trajectory to be on downsizing. I think part of the reason that tiny houses have become more widely accepted and more people are embracing them is because this notion that people don't want to be burdened by stuff anymore. Part of that stuff is a mortgage. People don't want to be tied to that and beholden to it. That increases freedom. It increases your, your freedom to uh, change directions if you want. So. I think, I think there's a lot of, there's so much positive about it. A, a little bit of the criticism that I have about the tiny house is that we, we could be using a lot less energy. Um, again, we circle back to prosperity. That is not how some want to, pro some do not want to prosper in that way. Some want to prosper in a different way on a, so on a single piece of land and have room to, to roam in privacy. There's a book called A Hut of One's Own by Anne Klein. One of the things that she says in there, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase, a termite sort of automatically is just comes pre-programmed to chew wood. It just chews, chews, chews the wood. That's what it does. We don't ask it not to do that. It just chews wood. And she connects us to being sort of like termites on the planet. We, are, we come pre-programmed to chew. The goal really is just to chew really slowly and savor every bite and to not chew so much. The connection that she's making there is that we, we're not going to stop chewing. We're not going to stop making. You know, if you ask how many buildings should we be making annually right now, like how many should we be making? Well, zero. We shouldn't be making any more buildings. What is the reality of it? We're building 13,000 units a day, 13,000 buildings a day globally. The U.S. alone will build 1.5, about 1.5 million houses annually. This is up from about 600,000 in 2009, 2010. So we've doubled it in 13 years coupled with the fact that construction prices are rising. Uh, labor to build those is getting harder and harder to find. One would think that as the cost of construction goes up, we start building less. That's been the theory with energy efficiency that, you know, the re why don't we mandate that all buildings are built to passive house standard now? Well, the, the upfront cost of doing that means the cost of the house goes up and that directly would affect the construction industry, which affects the economy. So we don't do it. 
sort of the data is telling us that the cost of construction is going is climbing, but the demand is climbing. You know, if we're going to spend so much on our buildings, let's at least make them energy efficient. Uh, you know, from your your perspective, what can you tell us as a population, or share with us to say, you know, this is what you, you folks have to pay attention to, because if you don't, things are going to get really bad. Uh, maybe an unpopular response to your question, Stefan, is that I can say nothing about that. I can't address that, but. The consequences are coming, and that's how it's going to be addressed, I think, through the consequences of non-action. Or if we, as a society, have a bank account, and we only have so much money in it, if we overspend, there isn't any sort of backup to the, to the bank account. It's empty. Deal with it. And our bank account is, we're, we're dwindling <laughs> the resources yeah. really quickly. It's going to go empty, and we will deal with it. Now, what can we do to address that? Well, it, hopefully the rate of that dwindling account, said another way, our dwindling reserves, will dwindle s sort of slow enough that we get to sort of experience those consequences really slowly, and we can auto-correct. And I see a lot of those auto corrections happening. There's a lot of movement in the right direction. And it's not, in some cases, it's through technology. You know, technology is sort of coming to save the day. But I think the thing that I'm most optimistic about is that I'm, I'm seeing gestures of conservation based design that we don't build it if we don't have to build it. And we don't. You know, we don't make the building a thousand square feet if we can make it seven hundred. That that's what I think is is ultimately going to going to happen. If we can choose slower, then I think things I think folks will begin sort of auto correcting. There's this word uh, that I, I grew up hearing. It was called Geldzeviel. It's a German colloquialism, and Geld is money, and Zuviel is too much. So you would say that in, in German, it would be like saying uh, uh, money, too much. It would be like someone lighting a cigar with a $100 bill, you would say Geldzeviel. And I think that, I didn't realize it really in, uh, until sort of late, late in my career that you know, my interest in tiny houses and reducing my interest in, in building sort of more with less came from hearing that all the time growing up, Geldzeviel. Like you just, it was, it was not acceptable to waste. Waste was not part of the equation. You know, you just didn't do it because it was not, it wasn't right. So let's talk about your students. Are they starting to kind of, what you might say, starting to get it? Uh, 20 years ago, um, it was all about how the building appeared and not about what it was. And now that's just the program they go through. It, it ha you have to be able to speak intelligently about what the building is, not, ha not just about how it appears. So that, that's a huge fundamental change. The relationship between nature and the architect. If you want to appreciate something, you have to get to know it. I think you have to become in some ways, not afraid of it. And I think in some, in some ways, nature is really avoided because we look at the house from a position of refuge, that the house is, a, is where we go for refuge. So we have a tendency in, in, I think, in sort of mainstream buildings to disconnect from nature. The purpose of the house is for that, to disconnect. You know, the, the architect Brian McKay Lyons, who practices in Nova Scotia, says that you know, architecture is about, it's not just about refuge, it's about prospect and refuge. A house should be some place that we can feel safe and protected and secure, but have a prospect of the future from. We can look out and see what's coming. 
that second part, that prospect part, is not present. It's all about refuge. How do you sort of make that reconnection to nature? It's just look at the sun. That's it. Like, that's a good place to start. Because if you have your, if you just know where the sun comes up, or where it is midday, and where it sets, summer solstice, winter solstice, if you get that, and then just use that to think carefully about window placement, fenestration on the building, that's a good first start that, to reconnect the built environment to um, the natural environment. You know, to, to reconnect to the rest of the world, I should say. You know, just look at the sun. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt Lutz. If you did, please share with friends, family, and colleagues. You can follow Nature Revisited on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as on our website, nordenproductions.com. The music for this episode is by Ben Cosgrove. The piece called Landfall which was recorded live at Kendall Station. If you already follow Nature Revisited, please consider showing your support by rating and reviewing this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Nature Revisited would also like to thank David Lipo for his continued support of Nature Revisited. We thank you. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Norden and Charles Gagan. And I hope you will join us for our next edition. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature.